So I think we should get started. People are starting to come in. Okay, great. Alright guys, as you know, this is the Unplugged Talk we have with Scott Guthrie every three months. Uh, it's an open Q&A session. Feel free to ask Scott basically everything or anything you can think of. And the questions are actually starting to come in, Scott. Scott, over to you. Great. For people that are uh, new to this format, um, as I mentioned, I do it about every two months. Uh, any question is fair game. There's a Q&A manager uh, that I think should probably show up um, uh, on your toolbar there. It says Q&A at the top. And basically you can type to ask a question, and then it will show up in the uh, list for me to look at. Uh, and so uh, this format is unplugged, so I'll do a little bit of a talking at the beginning just to set some context and let people think of questions. Uh, but since it is an unplugged session, um, please do ask questions because basically – uh, the way it works is uh, you ask questions, and I kind of dynamically construct the talk on the fly. And so if you don't ask questions, uh, the talk ends up being uh, fairly short and dry because we just sit around staring at each other. Um, so do please ask questions. Any question is fair game. Uh, anything .NET related, Visual Studio, Microsoft, College Basketball, um, you name it, uh, and I can try to answer it. Um, the more related it is to .NET and Visual Studio, the better chance of me answering it correctly. But, uh, um, but yeah, definitely any questions per game. So we've got a couple questions that are showing up now in the Q&A thing. Um, and so uh, do please start. Uh, there we go. We've got a whole bunch of new ones showing up. So good. So please think of one, answer it. Um, I don't – what I typically do when I answer questions, so set some context, is I try to answer a couple of them. Uh, that are closely related together. So I do tend to skip around a little bit in the list. So if I haven't answered your question, it isn't because I'm not going to. It's basically I'm waiting until there's enough in that area uh, so that I can attack a couple of questions all at the same time, and uh, we'll go from there. Uh, so anyway, so in the last two months since, since the last one of these chats, uh, we've had a lot of products that have shipped, and i um, uh, pretty excited about some of the progress that we've made. Uh, you know, I think since the last time we've, we've talked, uh, Windows Phone 7 has shipped, uh, which uh, has a very rich .NET uh, based programming model with Silverlight, obviously, as well as XNA for games. Um, and uh, we've seen a ton of apps show up in the App Store as part of that. Uh, we've, uh, in December, early December, we did what's called the Silverlight Firestarter event uh, and uh, disclosed for the first time our Silverlight 5 feature set for uh, desktop uh, PCs and Macs. Um, and uh, general feedback on that has been super positive in terms of a lot of great features coming, and uh, uh, both in terms of new capabilities and also just features that kind of address pain points that people have run into today. Um, and then also a couple weeks ago, or actually two weeks ago, or ten days ago, we shipped uh, a whole bunch of updates of our web server stack. Uh, that includes um, uh, a bunch of capabilities that uh, we're going to roll into VS 2010 SP1, as well as into a new tool called Web Matrix, things like IS Express and SQL CE, which gives you kind of a nice uh, improved lightweight web server and lightweight database solution. Uh, ASP.NET MVC3, um, which gives us uh, a really powerful um, uh, pro stack uh, web development capability, uh, as well as our new um, uh, Web Matrix and uh, um, uh, Razor based uh, templating solution. Um, that uh, Razor is used both inside ASP and NBC as a view engine, and also we support with this web matrix tool, kind of a lightweight uh, tool that allows you to create sites really quickly. Uh, and then we're also invested pretty heavily and shipped a bunch of tools around deployment, things like the web farm framework and things like web deploy, uh, which helps in terms of operations and scale management. All those products are free, um, and, um, you know, we think really take our kind of our web server stack to the next level. In the months ahead, you're going to see a lot more coming out. Uh, we're going to have the final release of ES2010 SB1. Uh, that includes um, uh, the, the web side support for web matrix, or, sorry, includes support for IS Express and SQL CE. On the client side, uh, includes a bunch of improvements around WPF and Silverlight and the design time experience around Perf uh, and some new capabilities on UI testing. Uh, that includes uh, support for what we call portable libraries, so you can now build an assembly that runs everywhere. Uh, so things like on phone, uh, on mono, on .NET on the desktop, and several lights inside the browser. Uh, and uh, just a bunch of other kind of great improvements. Um, and kind of as the year goes by, you're going to see a lot more things coming out in the .NET and DS space, um, kind of as we take the overall stack forward and ahead. So lots of great features and improvements coming there. 
Um, in terms of uh, with that thing, a whole bunch of people ask questions. Again, if you just join, you can use the Q&A manager and uh, um, ask a question. Uh, and uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, um, try to answer as many of these as I can. So let's see. Where should we start? I mean, a few people have asked questions about the entity framework. Uh, so Mark has asked, is the entity framework ready for enterprise environments and scenarios? Um, Daniel, last question, do we have an ETA for the Entity Framework RTM? Uh, and so uh, let's just actually answer a few questions about the Entity Framework uh, to start off with really quick. Uh, so for people that know, uh, the Entity Framework has um, uh, been around for a couple of releases. It first shipped as part of .NET 3.5 SB1. Um, and I'd say in general that first release, uh, it shipped uh, fairly lukewarm reviews. Um, some people really liked it, but a lot of people had some criticism about it uh, in terms of features it didn't implement, and then also around uh, uh, some of its support around testing and testability and just sort of, uh, from a patterns coupling perspective. Um, the, in .NET 4, we shipped a uh, update of the Entity Framework, but Entity Framework 4, that uh, generally has gotten really good positive reviews uh, in terms of really incorporating the feedback uh, that people had about the 3.5 SP1 release of EF and uh, really addressing it. Uh, the, the areas people still, a number of people still said, hey, I wish I didn't have to use a design tool and I wish I could actually kind of ha use kind of plain old POCO or go plain old CLR objects for doing my model creation um, and kind of enable a code only approach. And uh, what we're shipping uh, shortly, we said in the Q1 of this year, so that basically means before the end of March, uh, is uh, what we call our EF code first release. And that's basically an additional library that's built on top of EF4 that already shipped in .NET 4 and basically allows you to create uh, a data access layer where um, you just basically create a regular class, you can say product with a couple plain old properties. You don't need to derive from a base class or add any custom data persistence attributes. Uh, and then a pretty clean way that you can map it to the database uh, using either a Fluent API, um, uh, based approach, and uh, I've blogged about a lot about it over the last couple of months, uh, and uh, generally think it's a super super clean way to do data access. Um, and uh, kind of to answer these questions, you know, I do think it is enterprise ready. We're getting a lot of good feedback from enterprises that are using it, uh, and uh, the final release of that will be in the next sort of uh, seven or eight weeks. Um, the data team doesn't work for me, so I don't have, I actually don't know today what the exact date is, but I know that they're planning to ship it before the end of March, um, so sometime within the next two months. Um, I do think we're going to make it kind of probably for, uh, you know, people have often asked us what they spend at MVC. Hey, you don't have a built-in in uh, as part of MVC. You know, what is your, your preferred model story? And we've always said in the past uh, we support any data access model, and we actually have many data access models built into .NET. Um, that's still all true, but I do think you're going to see us basically push EF code first as kind of the default to use, uh, unless there's good reason not to. Um, and uh, you're going to see our tutorials that are already coming out for MVC3 uh, kind of default to using that as the data access story. Because I do think it, it works really well uh, from a patterns-based perspective. It's very clean, uh, and it scales pretty well from an enterprise perspective. So, um, that doesn't mean we're not, you know, the nice thing is because it's built on the core entity framework, uh, it, you know, the, the rest of the entity framework takes advantage of a lot of the core underlying features as well. So anyway, um, those are two quick entity framework questions. Let me just quickly see if there's any more EF questions, then we'll move on. Okay, so okay, so anyway, we'll move on to the next topic then. Um, let's see. few people asked a couple of mobile questions. Um, Sam asked a question, what is Microsoft's strategy recommendation for rendering content to mobile devices with ASP.NET web forms? It's a good question. Um, let's see if there's any other questions around that topic. Uh, it's uh, definitely something that, you know, as more and more mobile connected devices uh, and portable devices are coming out there, it's certainly a question a lot of people are asking about, which is what is kind of our, our recommendation for doing mobile web. Uh, ASP.NET in ASP.NET 2, um, and a little bit actually even with 1.1, supported something called the mobile controls, which were basically a set of controls that uh, created a markup that was specific for mobile devices. And at the time, 
you know, seven years ago or whenever it was that we built it, uh, most mobile devices didn't support HTML. Instead, they supported a model like uh, uh, called WML uh, or even CHTML, which was kind of a other markup formats that, uh, you know, old WAP devices and mobile phones supported. Um, over the last couple of years, we've kind of deprecated that. I think in, in .NET 4, we officially deprecated the mobile controls, mostly because there are devices out there in the world that, that are being sold that still support that. And instead, people are kind of moving towards HTML um, as kind of the universal format for mobile web apps um, that, that have broadest reach. Uh, and, uh, and so generally what we recommend in terms of building an app is you can use either web forms or MVC and target that. We just published last week a uh, blog post, uh, or actually an article on ASP.NET written by Steve Sanderson uh, that talks specifically about your question of what's the strategy recommendation for rendering to mobile content. It talks both in the context of both web forms and MVC. Um, and so rather than me try to paraphrase, I'd say, uh, um, send me an email at skyku at microsoft.com or send me a, a Twitter link, and I'll uh, – I'll send you a pointer to it because it's a pretty good, it's about a 20-page white paper that talks specifically about recommendations for how to structure your app and uh, ways to accomplish certain things. It includes lots of code samples. Uh, but in general, I'd say you're also going to see us continue to focus and invest heavily on enabling kind of mobile web scenarios from ASP.NET, uh, where it's not just the cell phones, but it's the tablets and, and other form factors. Um, and I think you expect to see more in the months ahead uh, as we kind of invest in that. But in the meantime, send me an email again, skyku at microsoft.com, and I will uh, send you a pointer to the article, and you can use that today. Let's see a couple other ASP.NET questions, then we'll move on to Silverlight. Uh, so Brian asked a question around uh, ASP.NET NBC. Since 2007, we've had four releases, um, and there's been, you know, bunch of changes and improvements. Are we going to see the releases slow down a bit, or is there a public roadmap available in terms of where we're heading with these and NBC? Um, actually, technically, we've only had three official releases, V1, V2, V3. Uh, we have had lots of CTPs and, and preview releases, uh, but only three official ones. But it's still pretty fast in two years to ship three major releases. Um, you know, in general, I feel good in terms of the releases that we've done in that if you look at the deltas between MVC1 and MVC3, you see lots of feature improvements and lots of enhancements, uh, but in general, not a lot of course correcting changes. And generally, kind of the, when I look at releases in terms of especially release cadence, the thing that, um, you know, I generally look at in terms of, hey, are we going too fast or too slow is, you know, between the individual releases, do we end up taking left turns and right turns a lot? And there are cases where I can point to products that we've done where I feel like, wow, V2 doesn't look at all like V1 and V3 doesn't look at all like V2. And I, I'd probably point to that as uh, not the ideal in terms of what you want. And I look at releases where I think, well, you know, we've actually done a pretty good job of building on what we shipped the previous release. And you can think of the next release as lots of new features, but not a fundamental reset about how to do things. Um, and, uh, you know, I think both with Silverlight, which has had also had a very fast release cadence, and I think with NBC, I feel kind of good that each release builds on the previous release and just keeps adding more. Um, so it is, we are moving fast, but hopefully from a learning concept perspective, it isn't a case where you throw away the book that you bought last time. Um, it's more a case of there's new features, there's more capabilities, there's more, there's more productivity, uh, as opposed to kind of a complete reset in terms of how you build the apps. Uh, in terms of kind of the release cadence that we're on for NBC, um, uh, you know, I think you're going to continue to see us do, you know, a relatively fast turnaround because uh, it is going after a space that's pretty competitive and it's moving pretty quickly. Um, and so uh, I don't think, you know, I think you'll see the next major release of it uh, in, in 2012. So I don't think you're going to see another major release ship this year. Uh, but you probably will start to see uh, uh, in the second half of this year the first previews and, uh, show up and the data show up uh, for you know, the V-Next release. Um, and in general, in terms of, you know, the teams right now are heads down and planning for it. But I think, you're, again, you're going to see, you know, we're going to address the top ten pain points and, and feature requests people have. I think you'll see a lot of continuity between three and four and hopefully between four and five. And so, you know, hopefully it's it's not, again, one of those kind of paradigm-shifting things and more as a case of, wow, 
they just keep making it better and better, and that's kind of the, the, the approach we're on. You'll also see later this uh, this year, we'll talk about it uh, for the first time at our MVP summit uh, in, in March, uh, is um, the roadmap for HBIN and web forms as well. That's something that a lot of people have, have asked about is, hey, does this mean web forms is dead because you're doing MVC? Um, the answer is no. Uh, web forms is most definitely not dead. Uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of improvements we're going to be making with the next release. Uh, and uh, we just shipped the previous release last April, so we're also in a uh, relatively uh, recent since the last major release, but there's a bunch of great improvements happening in web forms um, that we'll be talking about uh, later this year as well. So that also we're continuing to invest and, and bring forward ahead um, a, a lot too. Now, web forms is now more than 10 years old, uh, so it is more mature, which is why, we don't ship it every year, whereas NBC is still kind of a youngster and only two years old. Um, uh, you know, and so as products get, uh, have had more turns of the crank, you know, you do tend to see the release game slow down a little bit because there isn't quite the need to add as much. Um, uh, and that's, that's the best way to kind of explain the delta in terms of shipping velocity. Um, and kind of as our, as our projects, products mature a little bit more, um, we tend to slow down the, the frequency a little bit because there aren't as much, as much need to get features out. Um, but uh, anyway, so that, that's a uh, question a little bit about that release philosophy there. Um, let's see. Other questions? Um, A couple of server-like questions. Let me, let me bounce there, and then we'll come back uh, and answer some more server-side ones. Um, I'm trying to find there's a bunch of server-like ones. Let me make sure I get a chance to look at all of them. Uh, Joe asked a question. Can you please let me know the tentative release schedule for server-like 5? Uh, CTP slash beta timeline, and what's the final release? Uh, definitely recommend, if you haven't seen my Firestarter event that I did in December, uh, definitely recommend watching that. Uh, I think the Channel 9 guys just actually encoded it with smooth streaming, so you can actually now watch it in HD and, and uh, in a pretty nice way. Um, and uh, anyway, that's, that's, there's about a two-hour talk that I did about Silver sort of Light 5, where you know, rather than just talk about it, we really tried to show it, and showed off a whole bunch of great demos uh, as part of that. Um, and one of the things we did talk about was the kind of release cadence uh, that we're on for Silverlight and, and kind of time frame for Silverlight 5. And basically what we said then was uh, the Silverlight beta will ship the first half of this calendar year, uh, and uh, the uh, final release of Silverlight 5 will ship second half of the calendar year. And uh, we're still on track for both of those. Um, so uh, expect to hear a lot more about that uh, in the months ahead. Uh, but uh, we're making good progress, and uh, we'll share more details about release schedules, um, you know, once once we have those uh, in hand. Um, let's see, a couple other questions. A uh, little bit of gas, what's going to become a Silverlight? Will it be limited to Windows Phone 7? Uh, no, it's definitely not uh, limited to Windows Phone 7. Definitely, again, recommend checking out my Firestarter event um, in December. Uh, I guess, you know, I think I have, like, 500,000 people watch my keynote already, which is kind of amazing. Um, you can be the 501st person, 501st thousandth person. Um, but uh, 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 I think with like 5, you can kind of see the big investments we're making there. Um, and obviously that will work, uh, you know, PC, Mac, um, phone, uh, et cetera. And so um, uh, in particular, I think in the Firestarter event, you can see a lot of investment that we're making for uh, enterprise as well as for line of business based development. Uh, and so, some really good work there. Uh, Jan asked the question Will we see direct database access in future versions of Silverlight? Uh, we haven't talked specifically about that yet. I think at some point you will see a local data cache in Silverlight. Um, we haven't talked publicly about that feature yet, but that is something that, that uh, people keep asking us for and, and is something that we're looking at. Um, we probably won't ever directly allow a Silverlight app to talk to a remote database, like a SQL server, in a two-tier way. Um, generally, both from a scale management and security perspective, uh, we probably won't do that. Instead, we'll kind of encourage you to use, uh, you know, WCF or REST-based services or WS, uh, WCF RIA services um, to basically talk to a middle-tier web server that then connects to the database. 
but uh, we are looking at, at the ability to have a, an offline cache that runs on the client, so you can cache data as well in the future. Um, let me do a couple other satellite questions. Duncan asked a question about the new Silverlight 5 3D API. Um, and kind of asked, is it going to be similar formats to WPF? Um, we haven't kind of published the API spec yet for Silverlight 5 on the 3D front. Um, I think you're going to see the 3D API look a lot sim more similar actually to XNA. Um, WPF does have a 3D API, but it's it's a fairly high we level need the speakers API. for right now. Oops. Uh, it's a fairly high level API, um, and uh, um, I think you're going to see us uh, with the Silverlight 5 API be a little bit more low level and uh, have a little bit more API parity with XNA. Um, and we think ultimately that gives you a little bit more power um, and flexibility. Uh, and generally for the people that have seen kind of early versions of the API, I've been pretty happy with it. I don't know actually the depth buffering part of it, but if you send me mail, I can find out for sure. Uh, let's see. Matthew asked a question, which is, hey, with each release of several, like the differences between it and, I believe you mean WPF seem to be shrinking. Are the roadmaps converging or diverging? What guidance are there for choosing which for which projects? Um, and how easy is support from one to the other? Uh, basically, what I say is from a strategy perspective, it's certainly been our goal to have kind of a common UI technology that's based on, you know, XAML uh, that we can use everywhere. And uh, uh, whether it's with you know, the phone and uh, uh, Silverlight in the, in the browser, WPF on the desktop, et cetera. And, uh, and so, yeah, with each release of both WPF and Silverlight, you know, our goal has been to kind of converge the APIs more and more um, and get to the point where the differences are as small as possible. Uh, and so, you know, you look at from Silverlight 3 to Silverlight 4, there was a bunch of APIs we added, uh, whether in data binding, whether in some of the tech stack uh, that kind of got us closer. Uh, and, and likewise, if you look at between WPF 3.5 SB1 and WPF 4, there's a bunch of APIs that we added, like Visual State Manager or animation easing support um, and, uh, and uh, perspective 3D uh, that were originally in Silverlight that we added back to WPF. And so the goal has definitely been to try to converge over time. And with each release, I think you're, gonna, you're, you're seeing us get closer and closer to that vision. Um, and, uh, you know, the, ultimately the goal being that from a, a code reuse perspective as well as from a just kind of learning concept perspective, uh, we can kind of maximize that. Uh, in terms of um, uh, yeah, and, and one of the other things I was going to say that, that we just shipped, I'm going to be blogging about, I think later this week, is uh, the something we call the Portal Library Project, which talking about code reuse allows you to basically it's a, it's a class library that you can create inside Visual Studio, and it allows you to. Um, uh, basically, share any code that you put in that class library across all .NET client types. And so that means you can use the assembly within a phone project, you can use it in the Silverlight Rhea project, you can use it in a WPF desktop project. Uh, and so that's something else in terms of just kind of code convergence that we're looking to drive towards to kind of allow maximum reuse of code um, uh, within your projects. Uh, Sean asked a question about Silverlight Live Apps. You know, when are we going to have more, say, SQL reporting services viewers uh, with print support? Um, uh, we are working with the, the, the SQL reporting team. Uh, and if you look at my Silverlight 5 um, fire starter in December, uh, there's a, uh, a demo that we did of um, a project called Crescent, which is actually done with the SQL Server reporting team. Uh, which talks a little bit about some of our plans there in the future. Uh, and um, uh, that is something that we're, we're definitely looking at uh, and looking to enable. Uh, uh, Walter asked, uh, are there plans to support Surly hosted on websites when browsing with the Windows Phone 7? So in other words, are we looking to enable sort of Silverlight as a browser plugin on um, Windows Phone 7 in the future or Windows Phones in the future? Uh, it's a good question. And to be honest with you, it's something that we go back and forth on. Uh, obviously, with Windows Phone 7, we've invested very heavily with Silverlight as the application platform uh, for Windows Phone. And that's certainly also true with, even more true with the next release. We're doing a lot of big investments with Silverlight for Windows Phone v next. Um, we're not 
quite ready to talk about those, but you'll hear a lot more about them in the future. Um, the from a uh, browsing perspective, you know, the, the challenge we've run into just from a kind of a, a practicality standpoint is, and, and you know, to be honest, you've, you know, Adobe's run into the same thing with Flash. It sounds like, hey, good that you just want, you know, the plugins that run inside your browser to work on your mobile devices as well. But most mobile devices are kind of running pretty uh, weak powered ARM chips. And the battery life or the uh, network capacity is often kind of 3G based. And so if you hit a page that has a 200 uh, kilobyte, um, uh, you know, a zap file or a swift file in the case of Flash, uh, the download latency of downloading that and then also ultimately the perf because the app is typically, the applet's typically been tuned for uh, a desktop machine. You know, you end up often, and often the video it's playing, if it's playing video, is often uh, kind of SD or HD level. The reality is the experience often tends to kind of suck on these some small devices. And, uh, you know, if you, if you read the Engadget or Gizmodo reviews of Android with, with Flash support, um, it's pretty terrible. Uh, and, um, you know, you kind of need someone to tune the experience for mobile to really have a decent mobile experience. And, you know, frankly, it's, it's, that's to some extent also true with mobile websites. You know, the difference between a site that's been tuned for mobile devices and not is, is quite striking. So we're still trying to figure out, do we, will we support Silverlight as a plug-in on Windows Phone? Uh, we absolutely are investing heavily in Silverlight as an application platform with apps running in the marketplace. The plug-in part, we're worried a little bit about, frankly, if we expose it, will people build a whole bunch of sites that really suck with it and um, and versus how practical is it and how useful is it. So that's something we're still trying to figure out. But definitely Silverlight as an application uh, platform for Windows Phone, that we're absolutely investing very, very heavily in. Um, let's see. Uh, a couple other sort of like questions, then we'll go back and hit other topics. Just want to make sure I get uh, a few more here. Michael DeMond said, Silverlight, I'm very interested in the future of Silverlight for Windows 1.7. Uh, there's no mention of Windows Phone 7 support for Silverlight 5 at the Firestarter. Um, yeah, so Michael, don't worry. <laughs> Silverlight is definitely uh, alive and well for Windows Phone. Um, and one of the reasons why we did the Firestarter was at PDC. People said, hey, you just talked about Silverlight for Windows Phone. You managed to convince me that Silverlight's future was only Windows Phone. And so one of the reasons why we talked about Silverlight 5 and desktop so much, the Firestarter was, uh, you know, three weeks later or two weeks later was to uh, uh, correct that misperception. Um, ironically, you're one of the, the few people that have actually said, like, hey, you didn't talk about Windows Phone at the Firestarter. Does that mean that's dead? No. If, when we don't talk about stuff, it doesn't necessarily mean that anything's dead. It just means we don't have anything to talk about or we've covered it elsewhere. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Silverlight for Windows Phone is definitely very, very much alive. Um, and uh, the team's been cranking really hard on that release. Um, you'll see more about that uh, in the months ahead when we talk about the new features. I can't, unfortunately, disclose all the details on it, but uh, I think you'll be very happy uh, with some of the cool new things coming out there. Um, but, uh, and so, yeah, it's definitely uh, very, very much alive and a lot of cool things coming there soon. Um, P. Riskin asked a question, what's the story on log keyboard shortcut support for Servalite apps? Um, uh, control plus S and is not viable. Um, Send me mail, I can find out for sure. I think I think what you're referring to is there's a couple of uh, key, key mappings that the browser itself overrides, and so you can't do, like, Control-S. Uh, I think Control-S inside a typical browser actually prompts you to save the page. Uh, there are, you know, if you're running inside a browser, there are some limitations around the keystrokes you can, you can and can't use. Uh, I believe you can use any other keystroke, though, that you want within Silverlight. Send me mail, though, and I can hook you up with the team and find out uh, for sure what you'd recommend in terms of um, key mappings there. Um, yeah, I'll ask the question, what's the release date for Light Switch? Uh, Light Switch is a, is a uh, sort of light based um, development environment that we're coming out with. I don't know the exact uh, RTM date for that because it's, it's actually not built by my team, it's built uh, by the Visual Studio team, uh, but I believe it's sometime in the first half of this year. 
uh, and uh, I'll, I'll point to it as soon as it does ship. Uh, but uh, we've had kind of a lot of interest in it and a lot of downloads, and so that's something we're, we're looking forward to getting out there. Last several light questions, and we'll move on. Uh, and we'll come back and more several light later, but we'll, we'll move on to the next topic. Uh, this one asks a question, any chance of hardware accelerating 3D using silver light in the future? Uh, they actually showed in the Silverlight 5 Firestarter in December uh, a pretty cool set of uh, Silverlight 3D demos. And uh, uh, the news is those are all hardware accelerated. So, yeah, you'll see hardware accelerated 3D and Silverlight 5 show up with the first beta. Okay. Uh, let me move on to a couple other topics. Um, let's see. A few questions around uh, parallelism and async. So Brian Hartung asked a question, any plans for an update to the async CPP? Um, I'll confess, I actually don't know the plans right now around when the next update will come out. Um, if you send me an email, I can find out for sure. My guess is around the time that ES2010 SB1 comes out, they might likely do a new refresh of the async CPP. Uh, for people that don't know and haven't haven't seen uh, Anders talk at the PVC, uh, it's a really good, uh, it's a really great talk that he did, and so you can find it on the MicrosoftPVC.com website, uh, where he kind of talked about some of the new language innovations that are coming out in the future, and uh, you know the conception that you can think of the last couple of releases that we've done with .NET, uh, we've we've kind of focused on different things just from a language perspective each release. You know, at .NET 1, we focused, you know, frankly, just on the basics of the language um, and getting that in good shape. With .NET 2, we added generic support. Uh, with .NET 3, we really added, uh, um, and, and specifically 3.5, we added things like link and uh, the language integrated query support uh, and some of the, the kind of more functional style programming constructs uh, that are needed to support that. Uh, with .NET 4, uh, we added uh, dynamic keyword support and uh, better support for enabling kind of dynamic scenarios. Uh, the next major release of the language is going to be coming out with uh, the next release of .NET and the next release of Visual Studio. The big investment we're making is in async, uh, meaning asynchronous uh, language keyword support. And kind of the goal behind that is uh, a couple fold. One is if you, as you look at more uh, uh, hardware architectures these days, and you look at kind of uh, scenarios these days, you know, network connectivity is now super important, whether it's cloud or just web-based. Um, you know, services, communication, where you have apps talking to other apps is super important. And when building client apps, uh, say WPF or Silverlight, you know, one of the things that, that you typically end up doing is writing code inside your, your um your client here that calls off to services. And how do you not block the UI thread from rendering? Um, and how do you kind of address that type of, I call something and then I, when it comes back, I'm going to get a call back and do something with it. Today, you can use async within .NET to do that. Uh, but the code that you need to write in terms of uh, enabling async tends to be fairly crafty code, uh, meaning you've got to pass the state around. Uh, it's a little bit more verbose and kind of just... Uh, doesn't look as pretty. Um, so it, it, you can build great performing apps with it, but um, uh, you know, the code is, is often more complex than we'd like. Uh, and uh, forwarding .net is making async of first class programming construct within the languages. So you can write code that frankly looks like it is sequential code. So you can have if statements and for loops. Uh, but we have new word keywords like await and async. Uh, so that you can indicate, hey, I'm going to call an async method, um, basically unwind and use the thread for something else, and then when the data comes back or the call comes back, uh, requeue me and continue on. And the beauty is uh, you can write code, again, that, that you know, uses standard if for each for loop kind of constructs, uh, but which is basically async aware. Uh, and uh, can kind of scale and be parallel within your code. And the end result, when you see, if you, if you can get a chance to watch Anders talk at PDC, it's pretty remarkable just how elegant the async code ends up being. Uh, it's super efficient both on the client and on the server. Uh, and, uh, we, you know, we think it's going to be a big differentiator for .NET uh, going forward. And we'll support that, you know, within 
Silverlight, WPF, and, and all of our client assets. Uh, and then you also see us, uh, you know, ASIN today is already async, uh, but you'll see us support async at a deep level uh, within ASP.NET. And we're updating the base class libraries and the core.NET libraries, things like data access, networking, file I.O., to make sure all of them are async aware as well. And, um, you know, I think that's going to be a big differentiator for our overall staff going forward. Um, and so the async CTP that's out there today, uh, unfortunately, doesn't work right now with, with ASP.NET and NDC. You can only have one or the other installed. You can have both. Uh, I think there will be a refresh of it coming up probably in the SP1 time frame, so it will work with uh, SP1 and uh, new things like MEC. Uh, someone else has a question around F-sharp and parallelism. I'm trying to see where it scrolled off to. Uh, there's a question basically around are we going to rewrite our base class libraries to be more async aware or F-sharp parallelism aware? Um, and... Uh, uh, this is uh, Sotun's question. Uh, basically, you're going to see us with, with the next release of .NET adding async overloads um, and async support into the base class library. So as I mentioned earlier, things like file I.O., things like data access, things like, so like networking, um, in addition to things like our UI and, and things like ASP.NET. Uh, so we're not, we're not rewriting them for F-sharp. Uh, we're basically rewriting them so that any language, whether it's C-sharp and VB using the new async keywords, whether it's F-sharp uh, and, frankly, and or, frankly, any other language, even if it doesn't have parallel or async uh, characteristics, uh, can call it consumer. And it's not really so much, uh, I'd say, rewriting. Um, you know, we're actually, it's more a case of uh, um, uh, you know, kind of extending. So it's not rewrites of our libraries. We're basically just making sure that we add the async overloads uh, so that you can integrate async and parallelism really cleanly. Uh, let's see, other questions. Mark asked a question, a uh, data tools question, what's the proper install order if I want both the full web matrix experience and VS 2010? I asked because I want to develop modules for web matrix, but I also want to use VS 2010 for MVC3 Razor. Uh, you should be able to install uh, web matrix in Visual Studio in whatever order you want. Um, so you can install one or the other, and they'll both work. Uh, if you want to have uh, IIS Express and SQL CE support uh, within Visual Studio, you do need to install the VS 2010 SB1 beta um, uh, that's out there. Uh, but uh, if you don't need IIS Express and SQL CE, you can just use the vanilla VS 2010 RTM, install MVC, and then install WebMatrix, and it'll just work. Or you can install WebMatrix and then install VS 2010 and MVC. So the order shouldn't matter. Uh, Dave B. asked a question, Bing Visual Search, Windows Phone 7 only shows the top 3,000 apps and only for ENUS and ENGB. Is there a plan to rectify this and show all apps? Uh, good question. I didn't actually know that. If you send me an email at skycrew.wikeshow.com, I'll hook you up with the marketplace guys and try to find out. I, I wasn't aware it was only the top 3,000 that we showed. Um, send me an email and uh, I can try to find out um, what the plan is with that. Simon asked a question, well, i do a couple more server questions here. Simon asked a question, do you guys intend to release any documentation or any great or any work on the integration of the Web Farm framework into the website control panel that you guys manage? Uh, the answer is yes. We are actually looking to uh, um, integrate the, the uh, website panel with our uh, uh, Web Farm framework that we shipped. Uh, in, in general, you're going to see a, a pretty big push around just from end-to-end -end management and uh, both for private and public cloud uh, offerings that we'll be coming out with in the future. Um, and uh, we'll make that available free for anyone to download and install on top of Windows. If you send me an email, I can, uh, I can maybe give you some specific answers around uh, website panel integration with uh, Web Farm Framework that you can use today. Uh, let's see, a couple other quick server questions. Kevin Nord asked the question, are there any detailed docs on the built-in HTTP modules in ASP.NET, such as profile file authorization, default author authentication, and how they may or may not affect the HTTP response headers? 
Uh, good question. What I'd recommend is actually send me an email again at skypeq at mugshot.com, and uh, I will follow up, and um, uh, we might have documentation on some of that, but if you just send me the specific things you're looking for, I can find the answer for you. Uh, my guess is it might just be easier rather than sending you a whole bunch of documentation. You can ask me the specific scenario you're looking for, and, and uh, we can find out for you there. Uh, let's see. Two or two more uh, server questions, and then we'll go back to uh, do a few more server and client questions. Um, Andre asked a question. I think the community should focus more on showing how to use and take advantage of, of an architecture that can be tested. NBC and model view model are so great, and we need to know more about the benefits of using it. Uh, in general, I'd say, you know, I think one of the things that we need to do a better job at is um, to sort of tutorials and uh, uh, both in terms of best practices and also getting started and just sort of doing the, I'll call it the, the common 80% things. Uh, that's something where I was actually beating up our documentation team this morning around, uh, you know, we have a lot of great documentation, uh, but sometimes it's we, we kind of, it's sort of like really reading the encyclopedia to try to learn something. It, it's sort of hard to know where to start. Uh, and so generally, that's, that's a general theme that we're, uh, I think you're going to see a lot more focus on this calendar year, which is how can we basically uh, kind of summarize what are the, the ten things you really need to know um, in order to build apps, uh, have the documentation be very clean, have it be very scenario-focused, uh, and also have it hopefully show best practices and, uh, um, and and so forth. And so I think you're going to see more of that and more focus on that uh, uh, this calendar year. Um, and... Um, uh, yeah, so you should definitely hope we see more of that reflected um, over the rest of the year. Um, Sergey asked a question, which is, uh, do you plan to plan SQL callback support on Windows Phone 7? Uh, what do I think about NoSQL in general? Um, we, are, uh, we are looking at, at potentially supporting um, kind of uh, a data story with Windows Phone in the future. I don't think we announced today, but uh, when we do start talking about the next version of Windows Phone, um, you know, there's be a lot of details about a lot of features we'll talk about. That might be one of them. Uh, in terms of um, NoSQL support, uh, yeah, I think NoSQL, for people that don't know what NoSQL is, it's kind of an unfortunate name. So it, it, it causes people to wonder what that means. But basically, um, NoSQL, some of us, Better expressed maybe as document-based databases um, or schema-less-based databases uh, or schema-flexible databases um, is kind of a, a popular trend uh, in the um, development world today, especially around sites that have tremendously high volume. Uh, so things like Facebook or, or Twitter um, use these types of approaches. Uh, and there's a bunch of kind of open source implementations out there. Uh, there's things like CouchDB or MongoDB um, uh, that you can use um, from a variety of things, including .NET. Uh, there's a, there's a, good, a really good implementation that uh, Allende works on called RavenDB uh, that uh, is specific to .NET and has really nice link support um, and a really nice uh, .NET API for it. Um, and um, and so if you're interested in kind of a NoSQL or document-based database solution, uh, that's definitely something worth checking out. And part of the goal of this is, is sort of better flexibility around schema management and then also around scalability and caching uh, throughout your middle tier and your end tier. Uh, and that's why a lot of big sites end up using it. In terms of kind of what my thoughts are about it, I mean, I think it's, I think it's you know, it's most things in computer science, there, there's definitely good things about it. Um, you know, in general, I'd say, the, the best reason I've seen to use it um, comes down to something that requires incredible scale, uh, you know, like meaning like a top 50 website um, or top 100 website. Um, and then I would say, uh, you know, for certain scenarios where you want to have the flexibility of um, more flexible schemas and not having this flex, fixed uh, schema types that, that a relational database typically requires. Uh, there's a lot of things that are interesting about that. And I think, frankly, as a data cache on a, a client, like a mobile device, I think that also is, is interesting. Um, you know, I don't, you know, as much as I think it's cool and I think it's interesting, you know, 
I've seen some people that have asked me, like, hey, do I need to have this to scale? And I ask kind of their scenario, and they're like, well, I'm going to have 100 users hitting my app. And it's like, well, to be honest with you, uh, you know, a relational database can easily scale to a website that's top 100 even, um, or even certainly top 200. And, you know, for 99.9% .9 of apps out there in the world, um, it's hard to hit the scaling limit of a relational database, whether it's SQL Server, you know, MySQL, Oracle, what have you. And so, um, you know, as much as we all want to build the next Facebook uh, and have our sites take off that way, the reality is most of us, 99.9% .9 of us won't. Um, and uh, that's, that would be my only caution in terms of the NoSQL approach is I think it is cool. I think it's, it's really interesting. Um, but I think some people are probably using it a little bit more aggressively than they need to um, based on what their scenario actually requires. Um, and, uh, um, you know, so that, that's the only uh, thing there. But, but if you haven't checked out NoSQL or want to read more about it, RavenDB, I mean, the end is a really good implementation and uh, uh, works really great with .NET. So I think that's uh, I think it's, it's really great that you're doing it, and it's it's been really great to to follow along the progress on it. It's got a, a pretty good following already. Um, let's see, a couple of your last questions around Silverlight for Xbox, and uh, 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 Indar has a question about Windows 8. Um, I unfortunately, can't talk about unannounced products or, or future potential products, so I uh, have to defer any questions around something that might or might not happen. Um, so, uh, uh, sorry, but I, uh, those, those products are, uh, those, those areas are kind of in, in other parts of the company, and so I need to, uh, I can't really talk about anything that's happening there. Um, let's see. Uh, other questions? Kevin Norton asked a question, what are the future improvements that are planned for the App Fabric cache? Um, uh, the, good question, yeah. No, so App Fabric is a uh, set of middle tier technologies that we came out with, um, I think, June of last year. Uh, it's a free set of technologies for Windows Server. Um, and uh, App Fabric cache is basically a kind of a middle tier cache. Uh, that you can use um, within your typically server-based apps. Uh, probably the closest analogy would be something like Memcached uh, that you might have heard of in terms of a, a middle tier cache server. Uh, you can use it within ASP.NET today. Uh, one of the things that we're about to release, I think, this month or next month, uh, or sometime in the next 60 days, is a set of built-in output caching providers for ASP.NET. Uh, so that you can easily integrate that within your web apps. Um, and so, um, you know, that's something that, that uh, you, can, you can hand roll today and write some code to do, but we're looking to basically allow you to drop something in your web.config file and then have all your output caching going into that app fabric cache. And obviously that team is also building um, uh, a lot more uh, work into the actual app, ca app fabric cache implementation as well. Um, See other questions here. A few other kind of uh, middle tier questions. Uh, what are you seeing in terms of usages for Windows Workflow? Uh, what product do you consider the flagship implementation of Workflow? Uh, so this is a question that uh, Quizen uh, asked. Probably the flagship one that, that we've shipped is probably SharePoint, uh, which is built on top of the Windows Workflow uh, system. Uh, you know, other product, products that we ship, I think Dynamics and uh, a few of the other uh, products in that space also are built using uh, Windows Workflow. And, you know, in general things, you know, you know, scenarios where you want to decouple a process from actual code is a great candidate for using Windows Workflow. Um, and so, um, uh, um, you know, anytime you want to have, say, a business analyst sit down and, and wire up a workflow for a process, it's a, it's a pretty good uh, reason to use it. And obviously, it's, it's built into .NET, and there's Visual Studio support for it. Matthew asked a question, have you guys come up with any strategy yet for creating and using DSLs in Visual Studio, or is Zim just still floating around out there like Captain Kirk in the Thorian web? I'm convinced I've never seen the Thorian web. But, uh, um, 
uh, we, 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 were, we were working on a project called Oslo um, that uh, was focused around DSLs and uh, um, did use a language called N. Uh, I think we've kind of announced that, that we've pulled back a little bit from that. Uh, we're still looking at ways to use uh, N and uh, uh, kind of that DSL modeling thing uh, approach. Um, we don't have any official uh, announced shipping time frame for that, and it's still something that we're kind of looking at and kind of trying to rationalize into our, you know, across our, our product portfolio. Um, kind of one of the reasons why we kind of looked at that a little bit uh, and changed our direction slightly was we kind of realized, um, you know, DSL by itself is is only so interesting. Um, we realized kind of we need to figure out kind of how we integrate that DSL into both procedural and into kind of our existing products uh, so that it's not just yet another new thing. It actually kind of composes nicely within that. And so that's what the team's kind of working on right now is to kind of think that through. Let's see, other questions here. Um, Arthur asked a question about Windows Phone 7 uh, development. Uh, he's a developer in Romania, but uh, can't currently publish apps in the marketplace from Romania. Uh, is there a roadmap for when that's going to be available? Shoot, send me mail, and I will um, connect you with uh, a guy named Brendan Watson on the phone team, and we can find out that answer for you. I don't, I don't unfortunately know yet what the roadmap is specific to Romania, but he would know and, and be able to help rec make recommendations um, shortly. Uh, let's see. Jeff Young asked a question. Are we going to see Sprock support in Code First anytime soon? Enterprise development it so often depends on it. Uh, the good news, Jeff, is you can actually map uh, Sprock's to Entity Framework Code First starting with CTP5 that we shipped in December. Um, basically, you can, there's a new kind of like, I think it's exec method that's available on TV context. And so you can actually call a Sprock uh, and uh, take the return results and map it to models and have those models be change tracked within EF code first. So you can do that. Now what they don't support yet is the ability to do updates through Sprocks. So you can do all your queries through the Sprocks and you can map it and do change tracking. But if you want to do updates, uh, that today is still done with uh, ad hoc SQL. Uh, but at least that first part does give you the kind of first part necessary. I don't know what the time frame is, unfortunately, to support uh, updates just yet. You probably handle all your own updates with Sprox. Um, just shoot me mail. I can, I can uh, try to find out for sure what the recommendation would be there. Other questions? A few questions people have asked around HTML5. So Paul asked, can you mention info related to Microsoft plus .NET plus HTML5? And then uh, um, someone else, where was another question? Uh, Liquid Boy asked the question of, are we going to see uh, HTML5 tooling in DS or expression? Can you say anything on this front? Um, yeah, so in terms of HTML5, you know, HTML5 is something we're investing um, uh, pretty heavily in right now. Uh, and you can look at, say, uh, say IE9, which is going to ship uh, later this year, uh, does have kind of first-class HTML5 support within it, including uh, kind of hardware accelerated graphics, uh, things like Canvas and SVG, and a bunch of other uh, features. Um, in terms of kind of tooling support and, and kind of .NET support for it, uh, obviously on the server side with ASP.NET, uh, you're going to see us support HTML5 in a big way, and uh, you will see, you know, richer tooling support inside both uh, inside Visual Studio uh, in the future uh, for building HTML5-based apps. Um, you know, there's, there's a little bit of support that you can already see even within the latest release of ASP.NET MVC3 uh, for things like client-side validations and, uh, and so forth. We are using the new data dash format for doing, uh, that HTML5 promotes for doing custom uh, annotations. Uh, you know, you're seeing us use JavaScript in richer ways. Um, 
through, and, you know, and we're shipping more JavaScript libraries like jQuery UI in the box. Uh, and, um, you know, you're going to see uh, kind of more uh, in the future, including uh, some nice tooling support, or some nice runtime support on the server side with the ASP.NET to kind of integrate on the server side with some of the HTML standards. So you'll see a lot more later this year around that, and then you'll also see some nice tooling support for it. Uh, So I'm going to ask you, how about this question, do we plan to release the Windows Phone 7 and Azure Database SDK? Uh, well, you can use, um, from within Windows Phone 7 today, uh, you can use a technology called OData. Um, OData uh, is kind of an open spec format uh, that you can use to consume data from a variety of resources. Um, and uh, uh, one of those is uh, Azure um, that uh, allows you to take large data sets and easily post them in the cloud. And so you can use that today from within Windows Phone 7. And the nice thing of it's OData, you can call it from any other platform as well, uh, including obviously Silverlight running in the browser, um, uh, WPF, and uh, HPNet on the server. Um, and uh, um, so yeah, so you can actually do that today. Joe asked a question, hey, when we talk about local cache for offline use, um, will that be part of Silverlight 5, uh, or is that something different? Um, and uh, um, we haven't talked specifically about that just yet, uh, but but um, and right now, you know, I, I'm not sure whether we'll have uh, kind of querying support inside several like five, uh, which I think might be what you're looking for. But certainly, you can use protected uh, isolated storage inside several like five, um, and uh, I do think you'll see with things like Link the ability to do kind of kind of an auditory persistence engine. Uh, if you are looking at doing something today for that, there is a SQL Lite implementation that's been written in C Sharp uh, that you can embed inside your Silverlight app, uh, which might actually be worth checking out because it might give you actually what you're looking for immediately. Um, let's see a couple other quick questions. Chris asked a question, when we start hearing about content that's going to be at Mix 11, um, we'll pro uh, so Mix is our, kind of one of our big conferences that we do that's often focused on client and uh, web technologies, uh, specifically web technologies. Uh, it's in April this year, uh, and uh, I think you're going to start to see some announcements coming out uh, this week um, around some of the content and some of the speakers. Uh, I'm planning to be there. Um, and. Uh, uh, I think it's going to be a good conference, and you'll be able to watch the keynotes live uh, if you want on the web, and the breakouts that will be posted later uh, on the web as well you can watch. But uh, if you do get a chance to attend, it's usually a pretty um, fun conference, and uh, uh, hopefully you'll start to see in the next couple days uh, some more details around it. Andrew and Steve have both raised their hands somehow in the tool. Um, if you have a question, just point to people that have joined recently, uh, use the QA manager, so just click on the QA tab at the top, and I think you can actually just type in directly your question, um, and uh, um, and then it'll, it'll show up. Um, let see, other questions here. Steve asked a question, when will Visual Studio get control plus dot add a using reference for extension methods? It's a good question, Steve. Uh, I think you actually left a blog post coming on, on my blog a couple about a month ago about this question as well. Send me an email directly at stackbeatmarshall.com, and I will uh, loop you in with the person that owns the intelligence engine for C Sharp, and we can find out, because that would be a cool feature to have. Um, Steve, Steve uh, Swafford asked a question about the security development life cycle. Um, are there any ties to TFS or any plans to open up developers who are not using TFS? It's a good question. To be honest with you, I don't know the answer to, uh, but if you send me an email, I can find out for sure. So send me an email at skygrimmarshall.com, and uh, I'll loop you in with some from the, the TFS team to understand what the plan is there. Um, um, so that is a good question. Martin asked a question about Cyrillic language support in Windows Phone 7. Uh, I don't know the exact plans for that, but I think it's coming later this year. Uh, uh, but again, if you want to send me an email on that, I can find out for sure. 
Yeah, there are a few questions I do know the answers to. Uh, let's see. Quinn asked the question, what are the plans for VB.net compared to C Sharp? Um, in terms of uh, the plans there, I mean, generally we're kind of evolving our languages now pretty much in sync. Uh, it's actually one common team now, a languages team that builds all of our languages, both VB, C Sharp, and I believe also F Sharp. Um, and uh, uh, generally speaking, you're going to see kind of continued parity between the different languages. And that, that's something we're, we're kind of being more conscious of in terms of going forward. And so if you look at, say, for example, earlier in this talk, I mentioned some of the async stuff that's coming out um, with the next major releases. Uh, those are being added in parity to both um, uh, DB and C Sharp in parallel. Uh, and so definitely from an investment perspective, we're investing in both uh, equally well. And you'll see with the next release of Visual Studio, um, you know, both from a, a language perspective, but also from a tooling perspective, uh, looking to make sure that we try to get better uh, parity across the two in terms of editing support. Historically, C Sharp had some features that VB hasn't had, and VB's had some features that C Sharp hasn't had. We're trying to make sure that kind of um, when we introduce new features, we introduce them for both and, and do so at the same time. Uh, let's see other questions. Uh, Dave has a question about EF integration with VS database projects in the future. Um, Yep, we do actually have uh, deeper entity framework as well as entity framework code first support <laughs> coming with uh, Visual Studio database projects in the future. Um, nothing that I can directly point you at today, but um, that is something with the next release of Visual Studio, you'll see uh, deeper tooling support. And in general, you know, one of the things that we're coming out with uh, kind of in the months ahead um, is support for something we kind of, um, a lot of people call migrations which is kind of generally sort of database versioning support and uh, being able to kind of easily migrate uh, schema one to schema two to schema three um, and be able to maintain and retain your data as part of that. And so um, you know, I think you'll see uh, a couple of good libraries and better schooling support coming out in the future to enable that. Um, let's see, other questions. Um, Ludovic asked a question, any plans to push the mono Apache module in any way to get ASP.NET on Linux Unix servers, especially in the hosting provider space? Um, we do actually, one of the things that we are trying to do, and you can see this a little bit with, um, uh, with uh, um, the uh, release of ASP.NET NBC 3 that we just came out with, is uh, we're trying to make sure that when we release our binaries for things like NBC 3 uh, and with Razor, we do so so that uh, we don't restrict them to only running on Windows. And um, and so, for example, the NBC3 binary, and in fact, the NBC3 source code is actually released under what's called the MSPL license, which means that they can actually run on top of Mono. So you can actually use the binary on top of a Mono Apache server if you want to. Um, it's not something that we necessarily push. Um, we want to enable it, but it isn't something we, we actively push. What we have been pushing is uh, a lot of work around uh, making kind of our hosting offers on Windows more price uh, attractive um, and working a lot with hosters in terms of, up, you know, kind of up-leveling the features that they offer so that there's more value there and then also uh, driving the prices down and um, encouraging them to go down. Uh, and if you haven't checked it out, if you go to the ASP.NET uh, website today, so just type in www.asp.net, there's a host button at the top. Click the host button, and it'll take you to what's called our hosting gallery. And uh, you can find some really attractive, uh, from a price perspective, really attractive Windows offers in both the shared hosting, the virtual dedicated hosting, and what's called the dedicated hosting space. So shared hosting is when you have thousands of people in a single box. Virtual dedicated is when you have virtual machines on a box. So you might have, say, 10 or 12 or 14 virtual machines sharing the same physical box. And then dedicated means you have your own box. Uh, you own, you know, basically, you're the only one on that hardware. Um, you know, shared hosting with ASP.NET now can be as cheap as $2.50 a month for both ASP.NET and SQL-based um, hosting. Virtual dedicated, where you have your own virtual machine and you have terminal server access and full admin rights within that virtual machine. Uh, you can now get for about $23, $24 a month, and then dedicated where you own the entire machine. Uh, I don't remember the exact price, but $80 a month is kind of where that starts. So compared to where that, those prices were, say, a year ago, 
they're dramatically cheaper, and they're, they're pretty much on, in most cases, on parity or within 5 or 10% now of uh, some of the low, lowest cost Linux based offers. Um, and so I do feel good that the, the pricing around Windows based hosting has gotten a lot more uh, price competitive, and also the feature set uh, has gotten a lot richer, as you can see, it's continued to invest there more. Um, Stuart asked a question around, uh, uh, is, there, is Microsoft planning to develop a better story around dual development of an ASP.NET and serverlet-based UI, kind of one server-side solution that supports both? It's a good question. Um, yeah, to be honest with you, uh, I'd say we don't have direct plans for that um, in the sense of uh, kind of just an automatic support that gives you both server and client side. Um, it's something that's generally a little hard in any kind of coding-based approach uh, because you do kind of, a, a tr you know, focus on different sets of scenarios typically and different kind of ways of doing things when it's a, a rich, rich client app and it's a server-based app. You can obviously kind of do lowest common denominator, but it, it's hard to just say you write your UI once and it works in both places um, with any kind of good quality. Um, I think you might see things like with light switch in the future where we might try to support both mainly because that allows you to kind of up-level the abstraction a little bit, so you're focusing more on your data modeling and forms layout as opposed to kind of writing the code itself. Um, but, you know, even there, we don't really have any direct plans, but it's, you know, it's something we've debated about in the future. You know, and similarly, we thought, you know, with things like, uh, you know, that dynamic data, could we also do a server like based approach there as well, where you could get some of the automatic kind of quote-unquote it just works. Um, but in general, it's, it's hard unless you're programming at a very high level of abstraction to make it just work in both places from a UI perspective. But what we are focusing a lot on, though, is how can you share business logic and how can the way you architect the back-end solution work the same in both. And so, as I mentioned, I'll do this blog post probably in the next couple of days around this thing called the Portable Library Project. Um, it allows you to create an assembly that can run both on the server in the ASP.NET as well as on the client inside Silverlight and within WPF and on Windows Phone. Uh, and it does actually work on Mono as well. Um, and that, that basically within that class library, uh, the tooling actually will turn off any API that's not available everywhere. And so it gives you a little bit more compile time checking and IntelliSense guidance to basically make sure that the code you write will work in all environments. So that is something that we are investing in, and uh, you'll see more there. Um, let's see, other questions? Keith asked the question, you'd like to see IntelliTrace available in other, for more SKUs than just the ultimate SKU, which is the high-end SKU. Um, I definitely hear you, Keith. Uh, I wish it was available in, in other ones as well. Um, generally, what we try to do from a, a tooling perspective um, is, uh, you know, we, we start off certain features that are only in kind of the, the high-end SKUs, uh, high-end versions, and then over time you see us kind of pull those down into to, uh, um, the the uh, lower priced ones and even the free ones. Um, I don't know the, the current plan for IntelliTrace to move down. Uh, generally, you know, we need to have enough unique features that are in the higher priced ones to help uh, people actually buy them um, uh, and pay the money for it. Uh, and so kind of as the value builds up, then we kind of move down more features. Um, and it's partly so that, you know, we can – pay the people on my team and the Visual Studio team to, to keep working. Um, so we, we do need to make some revenue to um, help with that, but uh, that, that's probably why that feature isn't available yet. But at some point in the future, it will probably move down. I, I, I'm not sure. I don't think it will move down in the next release of Visual Studio, but maybe the release after that. Um, let's see. Other questions? Um, Pearson asked the question, what are the plans with linked entities and linked to SQL? Nate said we are in love with uh, uh, linked entities and want to continue to see it, uh, see that evolve. Um, well, the plan is, you know, we're continuing to evolve linked to entities. I'm not sure if you meant linked to SQL or linked to entities that you'd like to see evolve. Uh, but generally, um, linked to entities we're definitely continuing to make good progress on. Um, things like uh, EF code first. Uh, it's kind of a, a good example of uh, linked entities kind of continuing to evolve. And uh, with the next release of .NET, you'll see even more improvements and enhancements with entities as well. 
Um, Jeremiah asked a question around vertical scrolling. I use scroll bar in Serverlet. It's quite blocky compared to a typical browser. Uh, will this be, in, be improved with Serverlet 5? It's a good question. Send me an email, and I can hook you up with the team, and we can look at the exact scenario and uh, take a look at where we're spending the time on that and uh, talk about ways we can optimize it. Uh, Alan has a question about the C Sharp 5 async CTP. So he's played around with it. It looks great. Will that be released for the next release of ES, or will it release sooner? Um, that will actually ship in the next release of ES. So we're shipping the CTP earlier to get feedback, uh, but the actual release date, since it requires compiler changes and some uh, runtime library changes, uh, will actually ultimately ship in the next release of Visual Studio. Let me do a couple other quick questions here. Um, Jeff asked a question, is Microsoft helping out with the jQuery grid control? If so, what's the time frame? Uh, yes, we are actually helping out with the jQuery grid control. Um, we're actually, we're kind of trying with jQuery doing a model where instead of kind of us duplicating stuff, we kind of want to sponsor the community and add features that extend what already exists as opposed to simply duplicate stuff that's already out there. And so jQuery... And rather than take the features like CSS selectors and jQuery and put them into our own JavaScript framework, we actually just ship jQuery. Um, and with ASP.NET MVC 3, we actually ship jQuery UI in our default project templates, uh, which gives you a whole bunch of jQuery controls out of the box that you can use as well. Uh, there is not a jQuery UI data grid control uh, that's official, the official plugin today. Uh, we are actually sponsoring uh, some developers that uh, work on the jQuery UI project, though, uh, to build jQuery UI data grid control. Uh, and so we are sponsoring that, and uh, it will ship um, by, by jQuery in the future. Uh, so we're providing some sponsorship of that. Uh, and then what you're going to see us do on the ASP.NET side, on the server side, uh, is add features into ASP.NET NBC and web forms that take advantage of it. Uh, and we think that's a win for everyone. It's a win for people even, frankly, not using ASP.NET because they get a cool jQuery grid control. Uh, but it's also a win for kind of our customers uh, and developers. And um, uh, uh, I think hopefully just a, a win in general for everyone. So, yeah, so that, that's kind of our approach and it is definitely something we're focusing on. Um, Max asked the question, will Microsoft support non-mainstream .NET languages? Things like Iron Ruby and Iron Python were two examples that he used. Um, uh, we will. I mean, generally kind of our approach with .NET, I think we probably have about 25 or 30 languages total that work on .NET today. Everything from Smalltalk to Cobol to uh, Ruby, Python, uh, and uh, and more. Um, and generally, you know, kind of our approach has been, you know, how do we kind of foster and support as many languages as possible? Um, in general, you know, we tend to see people focus on certain languages more than others. And the languages that we see the most usages of, we tend to uh, – kind of put, put, you know, frankly, more wood behind the arrow, so to speak, in terms of integration. On the Iron Ruby, Iron Python side, uh, we kind of incubated the first couple releases of those languages. Um, recently, uh, uh, they, they, they were actually built uh, way back when on my team, but they've actually been built on the Visual Studio team the last couple of uh, about two years, I think. Um, a few months ago, I think the summer, uh, we kind of announced that uh, we're actually releasing the source code to Iron Ruby and Iron Python under a permissive license, so anyone can contribute. Uh, and we're kind of sponsoring um, a bunch of community development around those languages um, and, uh, and kind of moving to a model where the community will own those languages more and will basically provide kind of technical help and sponsorship. And we'll also we'll have a few people actively working on the Visual Studio side and helping with that. And so um, we did put those out, uh, I think, in September, uh, and uh, you can download this today, and that does include some Visual Studio uh, project and tooling support for that as well. You will see us continue to kind of support more languages, though, in the future. We don't interpret that as simply we're only going to support C Sharp and VB and F Sharp. Um, you know, we are investing heavily, heavily in those languages, but you're going to see us support and integrate more languages into .NET as well in the future. Um, I think you're going to see a lot richer JavaScript support for .NET in the future. Um, 
you know, something that we're looking at now. Um, and I think you'll see more languages and, and more scenarios show up in the future um, as well. So I, I think that's going to be continue to be kind of evolving space where, uh, you know, we, we continue to add languages and, and enable new scenarios. Let's see. Um, Benjamin asked the question about the entity framework. EF doesn't handle modeling views well, reporting model errors. Any chance for better support for a read-only object? Uh, shoot me mail, Benjamin, and I will hook you up with the uh, um, the uh, entity framework team. We can, can get to the answer of that, or bottom of that. Uh, Quentin asked a question around uh, the REST starter kit for WCF that was before .NET 4 has been discontinued or is included in WCF 4. Um, we actually included a lot of the, the, the uh, REST support in WPF 4 directly, uh, which I think is the reason why the starter kit hasn't been evolved is, is we kind of built a lot of those features directly into the product. Uh, there's also a project that Glenn Block has been working on um, on the WCF team which is focused around uh, WCF or HTTP scenarios. Uh, and I believe there's the CTP out of that today uh, that he's gotten a lot of good feedback on. And that's also looking at ways that we can kind of integrate RESTful scenarios uh, within WCF uh, more as well. Uh, Shaggy asked a question about the next release date of Expression Blend. Can I discuss any of the features today? Uh, unfortunately, like some of the other questions around uh, you know, Xbox and future Windows stars, I, I can't talk to those. Um, <laughs> Um, and so uh, um, those, those kind of aren't my products, and so I need to be respectful of uh, other teams' disclosure plans around their future plans. But, uh, you know, we are, we are working hard at the, on the next release of Blend, uh, but we don't have uh, any details that we can share today about the feature set. Um, let's see. I think Matt asked the question, do you know what was what was used to develop the local runtime for Azure? Will it be available as an SDK so developers could use it to contain and run their own web middle tier applications? Um, I'm trying to remember what we've used for Azure on the development side. I believe they're going to use IS Express in the future. I'm not, I don't think they use it today, but I think that's the plan at some point in the future is to switch over to use IS Express. Um, IS Express has now shipped. Um, it took about 10 days ago to find a release of it, and we are adding it into VS 2010 SB1 or support for, for doing it. And uh, I have a blog post uh, from earlier this month that you can look up that uh, talks a little bit more about that. Uh, one of the things that we have done with uh, IS Express is uh, we released it under with a license that explicitly allows redistributable scenarios. So if you're looking for a, a way that you could give your customers a kind of local runtime server that they could use to uh, uh, run their kind of web and middle tier apps, uh, I look at IS Express because you can actually use it that way. And the license is such that you don't need to ask permission. We just grant it the redistributable license for you automatically. Um, so it's, it's pretty easy to... Uh, to do that. And if you look at my Twitter feed, uh, I think over the weekend, either Friday or Saturday, I tweeted a link that points you at a set of project, uh, a blog post about some set of projects that allow you to build a redistributable package uh, that you can bundle as part of your own client setup to install IS Express. Uh, and so there's some details in the blog post about that. Um, Uh, let's see. Ludovic asked a question, any ETA for bringing back IntelliSense to C++ with CLI? Uh, so that's a feature that unfortunately was not in VS 2010. Um, uh, and um, it is something I know the C++ team is working on adding in the future. Um, unfortunately, I don't have an ETA I can give you right now, but I, I do know it is something that the C++ team is looking at. Steve, just trying to ask the question, has anyone asked about Visual Studio 2010 SB1 dates? Uh, I mentioned a little bit earlier at the beginning of the talk, uh, we are looking at shipping VS 2010 SB1 in the next few months. Uh, we haven't publicly announced the date, and so, you know, it's always a little dangerous when, when, when uh, we talk about dates because they, they can move, but we are kind of in the final stages of SB1, so we're looking to get the final set of bug fixes in. Uh, we then will have, a, because it's a service pack, we do have a... Um, 
uh, escrow period so that we keep an eye on it to make sure we don't have any last minute regressions. But generally, I think you'll see it in kind of the first quarter of this year um, uh, show up. Um, but we haven't announced the final date so that, that it could move, but we are looking uh, to, to ship uh, the not too distant future the final release of, of SP1. Um, Patrick asked a question. I just read that .NET 4 is going to be available in uh, Server 2008 R2 SB1 Server Core. Uh, <laughs> it's probably the longest product name we've ever shipped. Um, can I talk a little bit about that? Uh, we can run any assemblies, limitations. Yeah, so there's a, there's a technology we call Server Core. It's a version of Windows Server uh, that runs without a UI shell. So there's no desktop shell. There's no IE. Um, is basically, you can think of it kind of almost like a command line console based version of Windows. The benefit of it though is it means that from a patching perspective, uh, if and when a uh, security vulnerability is found on a client component, you don't need to actually patch your server because those binaries are actually not installed on it. It also means that from a memory working set perspective, um, the server core image uses a lot less memory than something that has uh, say a UI shell running on it. And so you can actually get better density on server boxes. Uh, server core today supports .NET 3.5 SB1, uh, but has not supported yet .NET 4. Uh, that's mainly because it's, it's a little bit more of an embedded uh, SKU scenario. Uh, one of the things we just announced in the last week is that we are bringing uh, .NET 4 to server core. And kind of as Patrick called out, it'll be available with uh, server 2008 R2 SB1. Uh, which will, I think, ship also in the next couple weeks uh, or months. I could be wrong. Sometime, sometime in the next two or three months, I, I believe, is when it comes out. Um, and, uh, and so it'll just be built into there. And so that will allow you to run .NET 4 apps on it. Um, the limitation is you can use any server component on it. So you can use ASP.NET, you can use WCF, and so forth. Um, because there's no UI on the server, you couldn't, for example, launch a WPF app or a Silverlight app. Um, uh, because there's, there's no UI to actually display. But yeah, on the server side, you'll be able to use it. So data access, WCF, ASP.NET, et cetera. So we're almost out of time. We've got four minutes. Uh, there's one or two kind of more thematic questions. Um, oh, Dawson asked a question. I thought this was starting an hour and a half ago. Is there a new ETA for when it'll begin? Um, Actually, it has been going for about an hour and a half. Uh, unfortunately, maybe you missed it. What you can do, though, is I'll, let me point out here before people start dropping off. I'll, point, I'll post an update on my blog. So go back to my blog post around this talk, and I'll update it with a link to a recorded version of the audio once it's available. Um, and so if you, if you came in late or you missed it or you want to mention it to someone else, you can download it as an audio file, and you can replay the entire talk again. The last two thematic questions I'll kind of mention uh, that a few people have asked about is, Brian asked a question about community. How important do you think feedback and community engagement are for the success of Microsoft platforms today? Um, you know, at a high level, I'd say I think they're very important. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that we're trying to do is, uh, you know, find ways that we can kind of a, build better products by making sure we incorporate feedback earlier. Uh, and, you know, frankly, just make sure we incorporate feedback and, and really design the products um, with, you know, as much customer engagement and community engagement as possible. Uh, so I think community is super, super important. Um, and, um, uh, and, you know, I think, you know, one of the things that, that uh, you know, we've tried to do is, you know, be public around CTPs and betas and have enough, uh, kind of early bits available so that we can get feedback. Um, I think we've done a, a pretty good job of that with the ASP.NET MVC release, is, uh, in a plural, in the sense of, you know, typically we follow the model. We have four or five public previews before the, at least before the final release. And often it's, it's very early. You know, when we're, we're not feature complete. In fact, we might only have 20% of the features have been implemented, but it gives us time for people to kind of really chew over the API, give us feedback, tell us what's missing, tell us what sucks, tell us what's good. And hopefully when we ship the final product, it means it's really rock solid from a scenario perspective and from a quality perspective. And I think, you know, when I look at, say, the MVC3 release that we just did, um, I was reading a blog post about it this morning where someone was just saying, hey, usually I tell you to wait a couple of months before a new product comes out just to make sure there aren't any gaps or holes or, or gotchas in it, but 
you know, this thing is just solid. And, you know, part of it was because he's used it throughout the betas and the CTPs, and he's seen it evolve. And, you know, when you look at the final release, you can just see tons and tons of feedback directly applied into the product. And generally, I'd say that's something that we're trying to do more of, uh, both um, with all of our products, you know, and, uh, you know, several, several people earlier today I mentioned how they're playing with the async CTP around the async features that are coming in the new version of C-Sharp and DB. You know, that's shipping, you know, we ship that way in advance of even the rest of Visual Studio V next uh, in terms of getting feedback. But again, partly because we want to make sure we really get that feedback, bake it in to get that high quality. So I do think community is super important. And I you know, want to say I keep thinking to everyone in the community that helps make the community successful and helps other people in the community. Um, yeah, I think that's just really great. The two last thing questions I'll, I'll mention are uh, uh, you know, someone has asked me earlier, uh, how do you keep up with all this stuff? You know, it feels like, gosh, we have things coming out, um, you know, every month. Uh, how, do you, how do you not feel overwhelmed about all the new technology um, out there? And you know, generally I'd say it's a little bit, uh, uh, you know, the answer I'll give you might sound easier said than done, but, you know, I think part of it is as a developer, one of the things I'd recommend is, is you know, keep an eye on my blog, keep an eye on what the trends are and some of the big kind of incubations and, and kind of trends that we're doing and kind of just know the overall landscape so that if you hear a term, you can have some rough sense of what it's doing. But don't feel like you need to know everything. Um, and uh, in the sense of it's impossible for anyone to keep everything in their head. Um, and... You know, I think sometimes when I talk to people that feel like, hey, I'm overwhelmed, there's so many new things, you know, I kind of I'll usually push and say, well, how many of these things do you need to use? And they'll say, well, I don't think I need to use any of them. I say, well, don't, don't go spending days trying to learn something you don't think you're going to use. You know, focus on the areas that you, that you um, uh, care about. Keep an eye on everything else. And from a developer perspective, if you're learning good best practices in terms of writing code, in terms of designing things, in terms of architecting things, and in terms of kind of building good software, uh, those are the types of skills that, regardless of what specific technology you, you work with, uh, you know, will continue to kind of get stronger and evolve. And that means that when you do need to learn a new technology, you've got the core skills in terms of development, design, and execution already kind of understood. And you can easily pick up any new APIs that we happen to, to, to ship and put out there. Um, and, you know, as much as it makes it, you people, you know, say, like, hey, we're ship, you know, we're, we're renovating too fast. You know, at the same time, I get people that will tell me we're not innovating fast enough. So it's, it, there is a balance. You know, in general, I'd say it's better to, to innovate fast as opposed to slow. Um, that's a, it's better to be too fast than too slow. Um, and, uh, and hopefully, you know, we try to innovate with good quality. And I, I do think when I look at the last couple of releases that we've done for the last couple of years, whether it's with .NET 4, whether it's with Silverlight 4, whether it's with, um, you know, uh, ASP.NET 4, MVC 3, or, or uh, Silverlight for Phone and Visual Studio 2010, um, yeah, I think we're doing a pretty good job in terms of keeping a high quality and from a scenario perspective, a pretty good uh, scenario-focused approach. Um, you know, we're going to keep trying to do that. Uh, you know, we are going to try to make sure that we're shipping and innovating fast. Uh, but we want to make sure that we're we're kind of um, moving fast, but not too fast, uh, and uh, making sure we keep a very high quality bar. And hopefully, you're seeing with things like Silverlight across the different releases, things like uh, HTML MVC across the different releases, and things like you know even very mature products like Webforms. Um, you know, from release to release, hopefully you're seeing consistency, and you're seeing where we're kind of extending, adding, enhancing. Um, as opposed to completely changing from time to time, uh, and, uh, you know, um, hopefully making the overall staff better. And lastly, uh, Brian Anderson asked, what's the most exciting thing I see for 2011 um, for developers? Uh, you know, I think, develop, I think 2011 is going to be a pretty exciting year, um, hopefully especially in the .NET space. Uh, you know, I think the thing I'm most excited about are is um, – you know, I think you're going to see a bunch of things that are coming out this year that I think just continue, you know, you've seen some of the web stack releases that just came out 10 days ago, but I think hopefully simplify the code that you write, um, you know, less code, less cruft in the code, um, kind of more elegant code, 
uh, and from a conceptual perspective, more productivity. You know, it's doing more for you. It's guiding you. The tools are kind of working with you as, as opposed to fighting you. Uh, and I think you're going to hopefully see that trend continue over the next, uh, the remainder of the year and next year. Uh, you know, things like the async stuff, I'm incredibly excited about from a language perspective because I think it gives us the opportunity to do kind of what we did with link and query, where we can just make uh, async kind of a, a natural part of the language. And, and that's, that's a huge, uh, making that feel easy and productive and clean, I think, you know, will, will hopefully be a, um, a huge step forward. Uh, and I think, you know, hopefully you'll see this, you know, whether it's with the new web forms release, whether it's with feature it's been NMBC releases, whether it's with Circle 5 and beyond, or the next release on Windows Phone, just a lot of investments where, you know, we're enabling whole new scenarios, but we're also just kind of making the existing scenarios and the existing types of things you're working on cleaner, better, faster, and hopefully more fun to do. Um, and, uh, you know, for developers, hopefully that's that's a pretty good combination. So with that, unfortunately, I think we're over time. There's still some questions I didn't get a chance to get to. I apologize. Um, definitely come again next time, and I'll try to get to them. Um, and uh, um, uh, and or I'll be blogging lots more. Definitely ask me his comments on my blog. And if you have a burning question, you can always send me an email at uh, skygoo at microsoft.com. Uh, my, my Twitter address is twitter.com slash skygoo, and you can go to my blog at weblogs.asp.net slash skygoo. And, uh, again, I want to say a huge thank you to, for everyone coming uh, who attended this today. I'll post, again, an audio version of the talk on my blog. Uh, hopefully in the next day or two once the audio recording is uh, posted. And so if you came in late or want to share it with someone else, just go to my blog, click on the same uh, L, uh, LID Nug um, uh, post that I did over the weekend, and uh, it should have a link to where you can download the audio version. So thanks again, and uh, um, yeah, thanks again for using .NET and Visual Studio. Fantastic. Thanks, Scott, uh, yet again for uh, taking time out to come into our members here and answering their questions. Um, as, as usual, a huge problem, and again, you went through a ton of questions. So thank you very, very much again from uh, Libnick and all our members.